Welcome back, everyone, to the show and another sensational guest, uh, someone really admired and respected in early music, Professor Peter Croton. And he is just really in music education and as well in his pedagogy is really popular because he's written so many important books and his, um, and his playing is wonderful. And it's just really an honor for me to welcome you to the show. Peter, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Nick. It's uh, It was a nice surprise to hear from you, and I'm very happy to be speaking to you today. And um, I wish I had got you on the show earlier because, um, I mean, if anyone, many people know who you are, especially people who watch my show, because my show is very much into classical improvisation and just early music pedagogy in general. And you're one of the main pedagogues. I mean, you, you've written many, many important books, and you're also... From the Schola Cantorum, you work at the Schola Cantorum in Basel, which is an, an institution that I really admire because they have a fantastic philosophy. I've interviewed Professor Rudolf Lutz and so many, I think a couple of your colleagues as well. And why not have another uh, get one, another member of the faculty on the show as well? You, there's something going right in Switzerland, and I, I think uh, I want to tap into that well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Professor Croton, I, I've, I've listened to a couple of your other interviews on YouTube, and I really enjoyed um, learning a little bit about your life. Why don't we just get into it? If you, in a nutshell, could you describe yourself to the audience members, who, perhaps who don't play the guitar or the lute? Uh, give yourself a brief introduction. Okay, so um, I grew up in the United States of America, and um, I started playing uh, folk guitar when I was five years old. I heard some people playing in the street, and I realized this is what I want to do. I want to make music. Um, and so I started playing guitar when I was five years old and singing songs, and I started performing when I was six years old as a little folk singer in clubs and in schools and things like that. And so I was basically a, a folk singing little kid, just absolutely adoring music, not thinking anything professionally, just this is what I wanted to do. And then when I was about 12 years old, my voice changed and I didn't like my voice. So I decided <laughs> that I would focus on, on uh, instrumental playing. So I started taking classical guitar lessons, but it didn't interest me so much. What really interested me was jazz guitar. Mm. So when I was a teenager, I focused a lot of my, of my time and passion on playing jazz guitar. So as a teenager, I did play a little bit of classical guitar, okay. but my main focus in terms of my passion was on jazz guitar. Um, and I loved that, all the aspects of jazz guitar. And then now we jump to when I'm about 18 years old and I go to Oberlin College. Mm. And there was a, a fantastic classical guitar teacher fairly close to Oberlin. There was no guitar major at that point, mm. named Dr. Loris Chabanian, who just died in May, I'm sorry. Oh. And I started having classical guitar lessons with him, and he totally changed my life musically, mm -hmm. because um, it was the first time- what, How I, do you spell his name? Ooh, C-H-O-B-A-N-I-A-N, Chobanian. Okay. Um, he was uh, Armenian. His background oh. was Armenian. He grew up in Iraq. He was a composer, classical guitarist, played a bit of lute. And he was the first person that opened my eyes to, there you go, <laughs> you're fast. <laughs> um, he was the first person who opened my eyes to the possibility of actually developing myself as a classical musician. Yeah, that's Chabani. He was a phenomenal teacher. And I remember I played classical guitar for him, a piece and he said to me very kindly, yes, there's some things I like about your playing, and there's some things I think we can change. And that started on this, basically, this four-year uh, quest to, to develop myself as a, as a trained classical guitarist. And he very, was very focused on, on a combination of developing the technique to be able to play the instrument mm -hmm. and also the musicianship to be able to phrase and articulate and express mm. the music. So in the time I spent at Oberlin, 
um, I focused a lot on classical guitar in addition to jazz guitar. I hadn't given up the jazz guitar yet. So I was involved in jazz ensembles and I was studying classical guitar with Dr. Chabanian. And in my first year there, there was a fellow at Oberlin who played the lute. And he introduced me to the instrument and I totally fell in love with the sound of the instrument. And so I was, as a, a college student, which means I was sort of neglecting my college studies, <laughs> I was devoting myself to jazz guitar, to classical guitar, and to the lute. And ultimately, I realized that I wanted to pursue the path of the lute because mm -hmm. it combined a lot of elements that I found uh, really fascinating in music. It combined harmonic elements, melodic elements, improvisatory elements, um, and also just um, a, an appreciation for sort of a magical sound that, that the lute can produce. So I'm not sure if I'm actually answering your question. Um, <laughs> this is but, a young Professor Preeton Croton. <laughs> yeah, so if you, you have to go back, back up a little bit. So that's me playing at six yeah. when I was a little uh, guitarist songwriter. No, sorry, I was writing songs too, but not publicly. Uh, singer. Right, and right. And then there's, then there's me with, with the lute. Um, so I basically decided that I wanted to focus my efforts mostly on the lute, Renaissance and Baroque music, because a lot of it was because of the instrument. I just absolutely was in love with the sound of the instrument. And of course, Renaissance and Baroque music have, have fantastic qualities that, that I really enjoyed. And even though I didn't play much jazz after that, I dabbled in it a little bit, and I still do today. Um, but the, the improvisatory elements that attracted me so much about jazz were also possible in, in Renaissance and Baroque music. I think that's a very long answer to your short question. No, it's... No, I don't no, it's know a, answered it. I know that in the classical guitar culture, it's very interesting. I mean, there's a, there's a whole perfectionist strain within classical guitar culture. There's a real, uh, really focus on tone. There's a focus on um, the way to play. And, and it's quite interesting. I, I know that there's none of that in jazz guitar. <laughs> people play with their thumb, people play, you know, there's all over the place. It's, it's, there's a, I can understand what you mean by this, a certain freedom. You're someone who delves into sources a lot in the history. And um, is there, is there something, because there are a lot of young ch children now who are learning classical guitar, they go for exams and um, are we giving these children perhaps a historical approach to learning classical guitar? Or is this a very, is w the way we're teaching it now quite modern, um, the way you, perhaps you might have learned it as a young man? Yeah, okay. So you're talking about the, the pedagogy at this point. Yeah. Well, sure. So the way young people are learning classical guitar is a very modern approach. Um, and this is a huge subject. We could talk for mm. a few days about early, <laughs> early pedagogy versus modern pedagogy. So I, I, I tend to be a bit long-winded, so I'll try to... Stay as long as you <laughs> want. <laughs> okay, so um, a typical musician studying, let's say, in the late 17th or early 18th century would have had very, very focused studies on counterpoint and composition and singing and improvisation. Those are the fundamental aspects of becoming a musician from the perspective of, let's say, the 17th and 18th century. Um, there's so many source, so much source material about those aspects of pedagogy. So let's just say that that composition learning to compose in, in the style that you're going to play in is, from my point of view, probably the best way of learning to interpret the style. Because if you can compose, let's say, let's take go to the lute world, if you can compose in the style of Silvius Leopold Weiss, then we don't need to talk about the interpretation much because you understand the guts of the music. So I think the pedagogy of the 17th and 18th century was primarily in understanding the guts of the music, the process of creating the music. So when we talk about improvisation and composition, they're very closely related. Mm. Sometimes you can't even differentiate the two, like in jazz, for example. So, if, so 
that focus on being able to compose in the style of the music you're playing gives you a deep understanding of the music. And then, of course, you'll be able to play it expressively because you know the music. It's literally like learning a language. So learning to compose in the style of Silvius Leopold Weiss is like learning German, let's say, um, and learning to speak it expressively. Now, let's fast forward a, a couple hundred years to the, let's say, late 20th, early 21st century. Of course, there are fantastic teachers. There are teachers who are focused on the music. But the, the focus then becomes more on interpreting somebody else's music and playing it as if it's somebody else's music, because we have to respect the composer. Respecting the mm -hmm. composer is something I've heard a million times in my lifetime. This wasn't so, <laughs> this wasn't so important in the 17th and 18th century. I mean, we'll, we'll get to this, but basically the idea was to be inspired by the composer in the 17th century, but make it your own. And now, late 20th, early 21st century, there's Mr. Silvius Leopold Weiss, um, <laughs> is then you, it's almost like you're, you're learning to speak a foreign language that remains a foreign language to you um, because you don't have the training to, you often don't have the training to understand the guts of the music, what really makes the music tick. Because I believe, again, if, if you, let's say you're playing uh, Rachmaninoff or you're playing Debussy or something later, I think if you can truly compose in that style, then we don't really need to talk about interpretation. Um, so modern pedagogy often has is, is focused on interpreting the music. Of course, yeah. teachers speak about understanding the music, but you're understanding it from the outside often, rather than understanding it from the inside. And because in the 19th century, uh, the composers started writing in a lot of, uh, let's call it interpretive, uh, writing in a lot of interpretive remarks like a forte, a piano, a crescendo, or an articulation, then then you, you can get screamed at by your teachers today. If, 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 you know, if Beethoven wrote a forte and you play a piano, I know teachers who scream at their students mm -hmm. for doing that. Um, so we're trying to I, I, uh, uh, Peter, there's, um, I, I guess the, the shadow of Segovia just really just is cast cast itself across the the entire landscape of classical guitar and i know there's a video of Sco, uh, segovia on youtube where he's angrily saying why aren't you using my fingerings or something like that <laughs> and and there's yeah. there's quite a there's quite a bit of that and not just that specific instance but in general there's a lot of that getting very irate over something in my opinion my humble opinion is somewhat marginal <laughs> so, uh, and getting very upset and very worked up over these things um but it's true and and it, it, it for me there's something odd about the whole culture in in that respect and i i think you're touching on it in uh in, in what you're saying yeah thank you um and and then you mentioned the word before perfection um that's a very difficult subject. It's something also we could we could do like several week workshop on what is mm -hmm. perfection and why do we strive for it. <laughs> um, but if I, if I define perfection, just sort of limit the definition of perfection briefly to what many classical guitarists um, strive for. So perfection often means I'm not talking about like paying perfectly with no mistakes. I'm talking about a kind of perfection in playing that is strived for today. It means that we have basically five fingers. I don't know right. which direction to go with my hand there. Um, <laughs> a thumb and four fingers. And so the gu classical guitars today are trained to get the same sound and volume with each finger. So you can play a passage with your index, your middle, your ring finger, or sometimes your little, let's yep. just say three. And you, you strive, you, you practice for hours and weeks <laughs> to get the same sound out of your fingers, even though yeah. they are actually different objects. <laughs> and then you put a phrase together, and of course they're playing musically, and they're going from mm. this spot to that spot. I, I'm seeing myself in mirror image, so I'm actually going the wrong direction. There we go. <laughs> so, uh, you go from this spot to that spot, and you learn to phrase, mm. and you learn to have a direction and an arc, but each note within that phrase is often expected to have the same 
tone color and um, a progressive, let's say a progressive uh, crescendo, but without, uh, an, they're, they're against unevenness. It's, it's hard to describe it. It's hard mm. to put it in words, but basically it's a, um, an evenness in sound which leads to then an expressive phrasing because the phrasing is the larger is the larger arc, hmm. um, and so that's a kind of perfection that may be very very uh, useful for certain kinds of music, hmm. but it's almost useless in Renaissance and Baroque music <laughs> because evenness is a modern concept, consistency is a modern concept. And we'll be, we can discuss, you know, all these aspects of detail, but the, the most expressive way of playing, let's say, late Renaissance and Baroque music is based on unevenness and irregularity. So if you have a classical guitarist who is trained in exact evenness, every finger sounds the same and every note is the same length, unless you're doing rubato, then you're far, far away from the rhetorical concept of unevenness in expression. Mm -hmm. And so when I work with classical guitars uh, these days, which I, I do quite often, that's one of the first things I talk about is trying to get them to feel okay emotionally mm. about <laughs> unevenly. Because yeah. they spent years, as I did myself, practicing to get this evenness. So that's the kind of perfection that is... Um, very prevalent in modern music pedagogy. Do is is that um, does that come from a nineteenth century or early? Where does that performance? Uh, does it, I'm sure because to give everyone credit, every, uh, people do source. Um, it might come from a book that some famous player said in the nineteenth century that oh you must do it this way, and then everybody does it that way from that point. Do do you know where that cultural shift happened? Is it maybe after the Baroque or? the 19th century, the 20th century? I think it's a 20th century phenomena. I, I'm i not as versed in 19th century performance practice. I've done a lot of reading, but I'm not as versed in it as mm -hmm. the earlier performance practice. And it could be that there are some sources that really hit on the, mm -hmm. the evenness of sound. But certainly it's a, in the 20th century, it became very, very important mm -hmm. um, to, to create the, the evenness of the sound within the line because um, the, there, sort of, there became this concept of expression is in the arc. Of, I still think I'm pointing in the wrong direction. <laughs> go, go that way. Okay, yep. <laughs> it's the arc. And then, so you have the expression in the arc and, and then there has to be a lot of evenness within that arc, according to many people. Um, and in the, certainly in the Renaissance and Baroque people, uh, in Renaissance and Baroque period, the, there is so much about the expression coming from language, which is by nature uneven in its mm. expression. So I say certainly 20th century, maybe 19th century, but uh, we'd have to we'd have to go de more deeply into that to see when people started. That is talking so about insightful. I mean, you're bringing up things I never heard as a child. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a major point you brought up, which is irregularity of rhetorical and expressive manner. Can you talk about the sources behind that? So what, what sources talk about that? And, and is, is how prevalent is that thinking? Is it a major theme of the Renaissance and the Baroque? It's more than major. Is there a, is Uba major, if we combine <laughs> German and English? Uba major. Um, yeah. So the basic... And is that the, something the lutenists actually themselves write in the, that sort of thing in performance? Wow. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so there's a lot there. There's the source material, there's the description. So I'd say it comes down to what I said and what you said previously. It comes down to language. As soon as the, the people writing about music mention the connection between music and language, then... Unevenness is, is a major part of that mm. because if we, in the, the European languages in particular, let's say Italian or German, if we want to speak expressively, and of course English, if we want mm. to speak expressively, we speak unevenly. 
if you want to if you want to sound like a robot, what do you do? I will talk to you like this, Nick, and we will have a lovely conversation. Okay, so that's even very good. You equalized everything. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. But like, if I say, if I say, uh, if I look out the window and say, "It is a beautiful day. I want to go swimming." It's not very convincing. No. If I say, "It's a beautiful day." I want to go swimming. Then what have I done? I've lengthened certain syllables, like it's a beautiful day. If I say it's a beautiful day, <laughs> I'm not expressing the word. It's a beautiful day. That, that's a three-syllable word, and I've lengthened the first syllable, and I've also put a bit of, of weight on it, extra weight on it. And we could, you know, there's, there's millions okay, of- Okay, wait, well, now, hold on a second, but then again, Instrumental music has no words. So, <gasps> so then you'll have to know, do, do certain notes have more rhetorical weight than other notes? And does that mean, oh, no, I have to learn a bit of music theory here. And, and uh, what does okay. that mean? I'm, I'm not going to answer that question immediately. I'm, I'm going to get to it, though. Okay. Okay. So it starts out with music being language, so vocal music. And if you're going to sing in an expressive manner, then you need to lengthen certain syllables and you need to put certain weight on certain syllables. You need to put weight on certain words. So in other words, if a word is more important, um, like I, I want to go swimming today, then I, I make swimming a little bit longer and a little bit more emphasized. And this is now we're getting into the uh, one aspect of rhetorical speech which is to deal at lengthen syllables and words that are more important and give them a little more emphasis. And now to answer your question or to start answering your question, um, the first source that I know that connects music, uh, of vocal music and instrumental music is Silvestro Ganassi, who wrote, who published his first book in uh, 1535. And he connects very, very directly the art of singing to the art of speaking, and then the art of instrumental playing to those two. And he, he you know, I don't have quotations right in front of me now. I could, I could grab something. But mm. he speaks about the instrumental players, uh, the instrumental players must imitate the oratorical art of, of the orators, of the orat oratorical speakers and the singers, because this is the true art of making music. So right there in 1535, we're, see we're seeing that instrumentalists were trying to imitate this rhetorical way that people were speaking mm -hmm. or singing. And very specific to that, when he writes about playing a wind instrument, and this is really the beginning of the source material, he talks about always uh, working with a two-note group. And this two-note group is going to come become extremely important in Baroque music, which is then the, the polar opposite of even notes. Right. Again, of even <laughs> notes. <Yeah. laughs> um, so wow. he gives us, he, for, for, for wind players, he gives us three uh, possible ways of, in effect, speaking into the instrument when you play it, for example, a recorder. Um, he speaks of, of a soft articulation, lera, 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 a middle articulation, terra, 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 and a hard articulation, teka, teka, teka. So there's three different ways of doing it, but all of them have a more emphasized syllable and a less emphasized. So if you do terra, 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 it's not terra, terra, it's terra, 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 terra. So imagining syllables and actually speaking them into the, the wind instrument is the first way of coming to terms with a vocal way of playing an instrument. And now let's jump 300 years or, or just go through the next 300 years in five seconds. So starting <laughs> with Gassi and going through multiple sources, the, the, the most important thing is, is that we're being told that the, the instrumentalists should, when they play, should imitate the way the orators speak or the singers sing. 
And very connected with that is this irregularity that we're talking about in note length and in note weight. Brilliant. So if wow. this was a major thing, that's why I said it's uber major. It's <laughs> it's sort of if we're ta- if we if this were if we're talking about theater about a, you know doing Hamlet and expressing yourself, um, and somebody comes in and says to be or not to be that is the question. First thing you would say yeah, is. You know, to be this guy can't act. This guy cannot act. <laughs> that, that is the question. So the way you you express that is exactly what we need to do as instrumentalists. And there's yeah, hundreds of wait. Of, that's of, that's like the most devastating point that should reverberate around all musicians, especially class. Okay, is that only for the Renaissance? Does that, or does that extend into the Baroque? Because I'm going to ask the obvious question then. When we play Bach, his well-tempered clavier, and everyone is just so, you know, it's just, do we have that sort of irregular manner and 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 sort of, um, the does the rhetoric also apply in the Baroque as well? Oh, absolutely. It, oh. It's, stronger. <laughs> it's stronger in the Baroque. Oh, it's, wow. It started in the Renaissance. And that's also, you know what, do you, do you know what Renaissance actually means? Tell me. Your, your listeners. It, it's, it's French, renaissance. Re means again, naissance means birth. So rebirth, renaissance, rebirth. What are they rebirthing? They're rebirthing the, the rhetorical and the, the cultural concepts that come from ancient Greece and Rome people like Plato or, or, or Cicero, for whom re- rhetoric was the, the driving force. Um, and this became very important in the 16th century, and people were attempting to integrate it more to the music. It became more important when there was a change in musical style in the, let's say, 1580s, 1590s, that which we call Baroque music. The, the, the reason why music changed Using why Josquin de Pre sounds different from Gesualdo or Monteverdi or Caccini is that music changed. People were basically in, in Italy, particularly in Florence, were saying, we want to do the music, we want to perform the music more rhetorically, but we can't do that with the standard polyphony of the time. Let's change the music. So they developed a new style of music that allowed them to sing in a rhetorical manner, which you know, I've only mentioned the irregularity, but there are different elements there. So they actually changed the music. And then the whole Baroque period is affected by this, including Johann Sebastian Bach. And if mm. you hear a, a harpsichord being played sort of like a sewing machine, um, where <laughs> everything is the same, then there's, there's no historical evidence for that. So wow. irregularity, irregularity goes, oh. through, goes through Bach. Uh, the, the rhythmic mm. irregularity, the irregularity of, of, of weight. Um, and th- it's an extraordinarily expressive style. That was, if we, if we ask ourselves, what was it that inspired the development and growth of what we call Baroque music? They called mm-hmm. new music. The, the simple answer is they wanted to write music that could be performed more expressive in a rhetorical fashion. And that goes all the way through Bach, through Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, definitely, who's, who's younger than Johann Sebastian. Um, and then th- things start changing uh, sort of in the late 18th century and the 19th century, where uh, instrumental music became a bit decoupled from, from the art of singing. Mm. So as long as vocal music, singing is the driving force, and that goes from 1500 to maybe 1780. But with over- I, I, I remember there's a quote by for, by Chopin is telling his students to go and listen to bel canto opera singers <laughs> to learn ornamentation and everything. So you're then, absolutely right. But then we have the 19th century. And the 19th century, as you just said, was highly influenced by opera. So we have, for example, by Mauro Giuliani, we have pieces, you know, based on Rossini operas. Um, and and Soar was writing operas. So... It's it's the the style of playing seems to have become somewhat decoupled from <laughs> from from uh, vocal style, but they still were extremely influenced by 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 vocal music. It's just that the the idea of of expression within the phrase changed 
the the I mean, there, there's there are very many similar tools, expressive tools mm -hmm. that are similar to the. I, I lost myself in the sentence. Similar to uh, the 19th and the 18th century and mm -hmm. the 17th century have many similar expressive tools, but okay. they're used differently. Mm. So okay. there's 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 no evidence that Bach would have been played ta 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 ta, -ta. Um, <laughs> but but many people, particularly in the late 20th century, had this idea because they were trying to avoid romanticism. And I think this mm. is one of the things that that uh, turned put early music in a little bit of a wrong direction in the late mm. 20th century was the desire mm. to remove romanticisms from the performance. Okay. So, um, okay. Okay. Performance in the second half of the 20th century is fairly devoid of expression because the people didn't want to play romantically, which I, which I support fully, but they didn't recognize yet that one could play very expressively, but in a rhetorical manner, as opposed mm. to a romantic manner. Understood. Understood. Um, you said something very interesting in another interview that I want to touch on, which is you said, slow movements were not played the way they were written. Is that, I think you were referring to Arcangelo Corelli. Is that is yeah. that right? Okay. So if we start in the Baroque period and then back up, um, there there was a tradition in the Baroque period of, of writing slow movements with long notes, like half notes, but with the expectation that there would be a, a lot of ornamentation, a lot of divisions on those notes. Now, we have many, many examples of that. So if we start now in the Baroque period, you have Arcangelo Corelli's uh, Opus 5, third edition from 1710, published by Roger in Amsterdam. And in it, um, we have the music as he wrote it, but also a colleague of his sat and listened to Corelli and wrote down how Corelli played it. In fact, it's in the... It's in the, uh, the, the title page of the book with the ornaments as Corelli plays them. Wow. Comme il les joue, as he plays them. So this is, if you look at the upper voice here. Uh, no. Right. Look at the upper voice. Yep. You see, for example, you have a, a C, a, a half note, uh, connecting to a quarter note C and then an eighth note C. So... Yep. A lot of people just played the music like that. And they said, well, this is beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. That's, really <laughs> nice. That's not how he played it. So then if you jump over to this, this edition. So this is the piece as Corelli played it. Um, do you see the beginning? Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. No, that's not exactly the same thing now, is it? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm having a hard, but is it visible? Yeah, I see the C. Yep. I see a lot of 30 second notes, 64 notes. Wow. Yeah. So basically, through this Opus 5, the, the 1710 publication, we can see, uh, at least according to this colleague of Corelli's, how he actually played them. We know from, from reports that, that he played like that. And so, like in the 20th century, a lot of people played Corelli and they played the adagios or the largos just with. That's the way Corelli played it. And then right. we have another source, which is absolutely phenomenal because it shows that it was done in Germany too. Uh, mm -hmm. Telemann in 1728 published a book called the Methodische Sonaten, Methodical Sonatas, um, where he does the, the same thing. And it's wonderful with Telemann because there's three lines uh, per per staff. The top line shows in the slow movements the the way it's actually normally composed. The bottom line is the basso continuo line, and the middle line, he's showing how it should be played, which is again with sixteenth notes, thirty second notes, triplet oh. rhythms. <laughs> so it's a teaching method to show people how to play slow movements. We have stuff like wow. that from Gemignani, from Tartini. If you ever want to, to really like destroy your brain, find the Tartini, because Tartini gives you a melody and then gives you like 16 different ways of playing it. Wow. <laughs> nuts. 
So that that's all 18th century stuff. But it's okay. Based, but it's okay, based wait. On your things. They did this that is in, this is incredible. This is this is too much. This is unbelievable. Now we we, we no, but we have to we have to now bring it to. Um, the notes, I mean, like, the, okay, that's that's fine. They can do it. They know how to do it. They they did it. So how do we do it? There, there needs to be some sort of methodical theoretical system that underpin it. So you wrote a book on uh, figured bass for the guitar, which I thought was really well received and very popular. Um, and you work at the Scola Cantorum, and they have a whole way of, I mean, which is quite historically based the way they approach this. What is that system? Because most people, when they take classical guitar or, or, or um, you know, the classical music in general, the pianists as well, it's they, they just, this whole system doesn't even exist for them. So what, what is that system that they use? Okay, that, that's, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, the scholar would probably like me to say, if you want to know, come to the scholar. <laughs> I, will, I will reveal, um, I will reveal the, the secrets. So there are a ton of uh there's a ton of meta of there's a ton of pedagogical material from the 16th and 17th century and i will run over and grab something to show you yeah because sure anybody can learn it it's all written down so uh one of the first sources and basically it's it's uh uh pedagogical approach to to learning to do exactly what you ask is this okay it's Diego Ortiz, Tratado de Glosas. Tratado is Spanish for treatise. Glosas is uh, the diminutions. Um, and he gives you everything you possibly could want to know to begin learning how to do this. So I will open to a particular page. So he gives you a series of intervals. And what, what um, is he Baroque or is he Renaissance? This is, I'm sorry. This, his book is from 1553. Okay. He was Spanish, but it was published, I'm pretty sure it was published in Rome. Okay, not here sure we go. This is not the right book. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's the facsimile. So now, if I can, I, you know, these would be good to, to pop up slides, but in any is this, case. Is this, is this it? Okay, okay. I'll show yours. Let me show yours. Yeah. Okay. So basically, if you look at the first, you see, now he doesn't have a clef, but let's call that a treble clef. Okay. So he's saying, okay, everybody, if you have a C, a long C and a long D, what should we do with it? Well, <laughs> number one, we go da ba 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 bum. And then the second version is da da di da 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 dum ba dum ba da dum. Third version, da 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 di da 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 di da 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 dum. And the whole book is full of that. So he'll so this is the second. Oh, <laughs> this is the second. And then he'll give you the third, the fourth, fourth down, fifth. He give you melodies. So he's basically with this book from 1553, teaching people how to move from one long note to the next long note. And this is just one book. There's I don't know how many there are. There's maybe like 12 or 15. There's, no. there's Ganassi, Ganassi in 1535. Yeah. I already mentioned Ganassi. He, he does this too, but it's absolutely bonkers. Because you have Ortiz is a great place to start because he stays fairly calm. Ganassi is giving you thirty-second notes. He's giving you, uh, I don't know what it is in English. Quintolin, septolin. Is that English? Like five against. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Odd groupings. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in German, I think in German it's quintolin or septolin. Maybe okay. that's in English also. Right. I right. lose track. Um, yeah. But in any case, so Ganassi, and then you have Bobicelli and and Rognoni. And Brunelli. So you have a whole series of books that are like jazz guitar books from the late 20th century, where somebody like Joe Pass or Jim Hall will say, these are the licks you can play. <laughs> these are these are Renaissance licks. And there's okay. there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And mm -hmm. so that's the answer to your question. There it, there is a pedagogical methodology starting with Ganassi in 1535. Okay, and going through the early 17th century, showing people how to connect the longer notes, and then you have the examples in music, up through Corelli, Tartini, Telemann. So now, it's wait a second, Peter. I I have to ask you. Now, someone will say, okay, well, but that's the Renaissance. I mean, how does that apply to Baroque music? Is it, are they do they just seamlessly go from one age into the next? In terms of diminution playing, 
Um, you can use things that Diego Ortiz wrote or Ganassi or, or um, Bobicelli. You can use those in the Baroque period also, but you have to adapt them a bit because um, when, when Ortiz, for example, was written, music was primarily modal. Mm -hmm. um, and now let's jump to Corelli. Music is, there's still some modal modality in it, but it's a harmonic music. Mm -hmm. So you have to adapt it to the fact that harmonies are changing. Um, the basic ways of connecting, of going from one note to the next, didn't change so much, but <laughs> music changed. So mm -hmm. the way we connect, the way we would do a whole phrase would be somewhat different between Corelli and, and uh, Bobicelli, for example. But yeah, right. you, if you want to learn Baroque improvisation, you can definitely start with Ortiz because he gives you the basics. Wow. And then you just expanded into the more harmonic content of the later music. So let's talk about harmony now. So um, now I, I, the rule of the octave blew my mind when I first discovered it. And, uh, and actually, could you tell me about the Renaissance harmony chord playing? I'm very curious about that. Um, I'm, and I'm very interested in that link from Renaissance and Baroque very yeah. much so. So let's talk about harmony now. Okay, so in the Renaissance period, if we looked at, look at polyphony, like for example, Josquin Dupré, then he was thinking contrapuntally. He wasn't thinking this is a sixth chord, this is a four three, this is mm. a seven. He was thinking contrapuntally, but chords were being created. So chords were being created sort of as a side effect of mm. the counterpoint and the polyphony, mm. but they were thinking modally and they were thinking of how the voices are connected from a contrapuntal point of view. Mm. Palestrina, who's later than Josquin de Pré, also played the lute, and he seems to have used the lute tablature to write a, as a score, as a shorthand for writing scores. Tab. It still <laughs> wasn't a real harmonic concept. Okay. Um, you don't have a, harm, a harmonic, real harmonic concept till the late 16th century, even though there's overlap. But I can't even say that because you have ground bases. For example, Ortiz, mm -hmm. 1553. I'm going to pull out my lute now. Yeah, let's um, go for it. So, so you'll have, you have this transition from modal music to, to harmonic music, but it's a long transitional phase. So you have Ortiz giving you his, um, his suggestions for, mo let's say, modal improvisation. But then he'll be giving you bass patterns like uh, which is pure har harmony. Mm. But they weren't conceiving it. They weren't talking much about harmony in the 16th century. They were very still much in the modal uh, idea. And so the, didn't the, they strum though? Didn't they strum alphabeto yeah. and that sort of thing? Alphabeto developed in the 17th century, as far as I know, but they were strumming because you have the like Renaissance guitar, four course guitar, they were strumming. So I think this is my own personal opinion and other early music specialists might get angry at me for saying it, but I think that they played very harmonically in the 16th century. They had their, their, the artistic music was polyphony, their theoretic concept was polyphony, but they were playing very harmonic music. And they just weren't really like calling it that. And it took until the late 16th century before they really started calling it harmony. So there's this transitional period because if you play counterpoint, that's for example, a piece by Francesco de Milano. I mean, that's a C major chord, right? <laughs> and this, that's a G major chord. Seventh. But they weren't conceiving it in that way. So basically, there was this transition, but certain, and even in the 17th century, they were still talking about modes. But then Caccini would, would write a G, and, and you know they play a G major chord. And then he'd write a, a B and maybe add a six, and you know that it's a six chord. But they didn't, they weren't thinking in inversions yet. Uh, if if mm. your listening audience knows what inversions are. So in modern theory, that's a G major chord. That's a G major chord in first inversion because it has a B in the bass. Mm. 
But they weren't thinking like that yet. They were thinking that's a G major chord, and then we have a B with a third and a sixth above it. So they were thinking intervallically. Mm. And it wasn't until Rameau in the 1730s that we have a clear theoretical presentation of, of inversion theory. That came super late. We're thinking of intervals. So four, three, and then a major chord. Or if you have a sixth chord and then a sharp six, if you're going by inversion theory, that's really complicated. But if you just say it's a normal six and a flat six, which is... That's what it is. That's all it is. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't remember your question. Well, we were just—it was just a general question on a harmony and the approach to harmony, yeah. and um, it ties, I think, be quite beautifully with um, this idea of improvising the French doublé, the the Italian toccata. Um, so maybe you could speak on that. I mean, I mean, classically, uh, just improvising a prelude. I mean, that's astonishing yeah. that that concert performers back then would make something up on the spot and and so yeah. like like kind of like you know a joe pass jazz guitarist could take a standard and play through it um can you explain a little bit about the thought process back then of how those performers on the lute would have done something like that would they go to it so if they had a theoretical gig what would they <laughs> what sort of thing would go down would, would they play at sort of performances yeah. So the, the preludes were used to introduce suites. So let's say you composed Allemand, Courant, Sarbangique. Nor Usually you wouldn't write down your prelude because that would be um, improvised. So let's say you, you want to sit down and you're not playing a real concert, but there's people sitting around or the king is there. And you have these dances that you wrote in C major. And so you might think, okay, I'm going to improvise in C major. major. I'm going to make a prelude. So basically... You, you either in advance or spontaneously uh, find some sort of harmony, harmonic concept. So let's say we have a C major chord, and I'll do this according to the rule of the octave, mm. and then a D with a 6-4-3, and then a 6 chord over E, and then an F with a 6-5, going to the dominant, four, three suspension, and back to the C. So this is our harmonic concept. Which is the first half of the rule of the octave. And then they had the various tools they used to improvise on that. So for example, if they want to do some sort of arpeggiated prelude, and there are many arpeggiated preludes, for example. All right. <laughs> Six, four, seven, back to the, okay, so, so we have an arpeggiated prelude now. And now I think, okay, well, I'm, instead of arpeggiating it, I'm going to make little, little connections like Ortiz might have done, but in a harmonic sense. Then maybe I think, oh, I don't want to go back to C major yet. I go to A minor. And then I have beautiful. A <laughs> it's, just, it's just having a harmonic concept and and noodling, you know, the jazz term noodling. So you're noodling mm -hmm. around with the harmonies, but of course in the style of the time, and which is which is basically staying within the, the harmonies and not playing flat fives and sharp nines and stuff like mm. that. So basically, um, and for me again, going back to your other questions, pedagogy, early music pedagogy. So that means if I can learn to do this that means that when i play a prelude written by denis gautier or charles mouton then i understand better what he's doing and i have a 
better chance of it interpreting it in an expressive way. So I really think from a pedagogical point of view, the way into the music is understanding the language, understanding the rhetorical aspects of it, mm. understanding how to compose and or improvise, which is which are very close. And then we don't need to talk much about interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> but we right, can. Right. We can, yeah. yeah. I know it's just unbelievable. Um, okay, I, I have the French doble and the Italian toccata. Is there much difference between them? Doble means doubled, so it would have an accent on the e. So in English, I think we call it a double. Mm -hmm. In French, they call it a double because they pronounce oh. it, they pronounce everything differently over there. You know? Okay. Um, and so a double, a French double, just is, is pretty much what it says it is. So you'll have, for example, a piece that might be in quarter notes. So if we go back to this sort of mirror, I'd have quarter notes. So let's say, so those are quarter notes. And so basically you turn them into eighth notes, you're doubling them. So, And it's, it's, if you understand that, it's actually pretty easy. So you just say, okay, the quarter note turns into an eighth note. So either I play an arpeggio or I do a little a little melodic gesture, like, like an Ortiz, and then you have your French double. Wonderful. Um, and what about the toccata? Well, toccata is then the, the equivalent, of, it's not the equivalent of the French double, it's the equivalent of the French prelude. Okay. So French prelude, uh, you know, the, the French prided, prided themselves and still do to a certain extent on being very sophisticated and refined and elegant. So this sort of playing, you know, yeah. the Italian toccata, then they prided themselves on being wild and experimental and harmonically uh, advanced. Um, and so the, the similarity is that you have chords and you do things between the chords, but the Italian toccata can be wilder and, uh, and more uh, impulsive. So mm -hmm. let's say you have a, a let's say you start on a D minor chord and you want to do that in an Italian way, you might go... What a what a nice instrument, and it's so nice when you have a great player on a nice instrument. It's it's so there's something about these stringed instruments that's just was it always extremely popular the lute back in in the Renaissance and how popular was the instrument? Yes, so in the Renaissance period, it was very popular. It was the most important uh, and widely played instrument of the 16th century. In the 17th Eat that. century. Wow. Yeah, it's just it's like the guitar maybe in the in the late <laughs> it's never, it has has it ever changed? It's always been with something like this, huh? It has to change because in the in the seventeenth century it became it became completely out of fashion. By the mid seventeenth century in England, it was completely out of fashion. Mm. The harpsichord took over. And okay. then things like violins. And then by the time we have the eighteenth century, there are still a good number of lute players, but the harpsichord has truly mm. taken over as the most popular instrument, in addition to things like violins. Mm. So it maintained its popularity in the Baroque period, but the Renaissance time was when it, it was at its, at its mm. most. For me, and this is, this is then an issue, if we compare, let's say, yeah, there's been so much to talk about, but if we look then just briefly again at the idea of rhetoric in music in the late 16th, 17th, and 18th century, the primary purpose of rhetoric is to uh, stimulate feelings in the listener. So the whole point is expression. The whole point is communication. To, so if I play a, a melancholy piece in the Baroque period, my goal is that the listener will feel melancholy. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the whole point. 
of it. So with a rhetorical way, I play... And I want the listener to feel uh, melancholy, mm. or I want the listener to feel joy. It's the communication of the so field, good. <laughs> which they called, they called the passions. Mm. Passions, we can call feelings. So transmitting the feelings to the listener or convincing them of something. Um, and that was the primary purpose of it. And I think if we keep that in mind when we teach and learn and play rhetorical music, yeah. that the primary purpose is not to show ourselves. It's not to be egocentric. It's not to show how great we are. It's to make the people listening feel something. And if that becomes our primary focus, then we get into an issue that you and I have not touched on, but could be touched on in a different talk, of stage yeah. fright. So I'm just thinking of stage fright. The <laughs> biggest cause of stage fright in classical music is because you're trying to show something. You're trying to show yourself. You want people to think you're good. You want to show how expressive, mm -hmm. how wonderful you are. But if your focus is on transmitting the feelings to the listener, stage fright can disappear because right. it becomes a communicative, interactive experience. And you used the word concert before. They weren't really doing concerts back then. They were having interactive experiences. And so if we can mm -hmm. learn through the music to understand the language of the music so that we can transmit the feelings of the music to the listener, then not only can we have a, a touching performance, but we can almost eliminate stage fright because it's not so much has less to do with us and more to do with the music that is flowing through us. Um. Peter, I just want to end off with a couple of uh, questions from my audience. Uh, I mean, the question might be above my head, but I'm just going to ask you anyway. Um, so this is from Elaine Cormier, and he's asking, uh, most accompaniment for French songs and Baroque music is done on a 10-course Renaissance lute, arch lute, or thurbo. It surely must have been very common to use an 11-course or 13-course later in Germany, a uh, D minor lute for accompanying. What do you have to say about that? Um, yes, a very specific answer. Um, the French songs, French lute songs, had written out accompaniments for the 10 course old tuning, the Renaissance tuning, until the late 1640s. Um, and then, uh, starting maybe 1648, there were continual songs that were written, and then the expectation was is that the lutenist or the theorbist would improvise the accompaniment from the basso continuum line. So then we have music by, for example, Lambert, Le Camus, which does not have written out lute accompaniments. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could use whatever instrument you have. The orbo was obviously very popular. The so-called Baroque lute, the D minor tuning, um, which wasn't used so much in France for basso continuum in comparison with the Theorbo, was apparently also used because we see there's a, a very important book by a, a man named Perrin, who in 1679 published a book showing how to play basso continuo on the 11 course D minor tuning, which we call the Baroque lute. Mm. Um, so I would say it was probably done sometimes, but what we know of that instrument is that it's a very quiet, delicate instrument. Mary Burrell says, when you play that instrument, there should be no more than three people in the room. And <laughs> it's so quiet that you can hear a mouse crawling across the floor. So I would say the D minor tuning is a beautiful tuning to play uh, accompaniment on, but the theorbo will give you more sound for the late 17th century French music. Great question. Um, and actually, there's, here's two more really quickly I just want to ask you. I'm glad you mentioned Perrine because he's asking a second question related to him. Have you seen a book, uh, Livre de Musique pour la Lute, 1698? Seems very interesting. Have you heard of that book? Uh, what, what do you think of that book? Well, I, I think it's very interesting. Um, basically, what Perrine is trying to do is he was saying, uh, we're having problems that only lutenists can play lute music. And because it's written in this, in this strange language called tablature. And so he tries to 
um, he publishes a book where he takes lute music that was in tablature and he puts it into standard musical notation. There's nothing so new or extraordinary about that book um, in terms of the music, but it enables keyboard players uh, to play mm. the music. And that's, okay. for me, the most important thing about that book. Uh, last question uh, from, from Elaine, which is, um, many Baroque lute players also accompany a large amount of repertoire on the D minor lute, but then they choose the thurbo for continuo. So isn't that kind of like a lost opportunity because you have all those patterns in your vocabulary? Uh, why not just stick to the lute then? That's a, a great question. And uh, if I answer it from a historical perspective, it's very clear from uh, a letter that Sylvius Leopold Weiss wrote and also that uh, Baron, so Weiss uh, 1723, Baron 1727, that the German lutenists at that time who were playing the so what we call the Baroque lute tuning, the D minor tuning, got fed up with playing continuo on the Theorbo tuning and uh, <laughs> solo on the D minor tuning. And so they started playing basso continuo more commonly on the D minor tuning and tune their Theorbos like that. So from a historical point of view, if you play a Theorbo for German music, let's say Telemann or Handel, then probably the D minor tuning was used more commonly than what we consider the Theorbo tuning. And then there's evidence as we get later in the century that the, because the instruments were so big, they left off the first string. So it doesn't go all the way up to F, it only goes up to D. I personally think it's a fantastic tuning and it works much better for the music, this mm. D minor tuning, because you have more contrapuntal possibilities. The Theorbo, I don't think in its tuning the way people use it today is very is so good for uh, 18th century German music because it doesn't have the two higher strings. So tune your theorbo like a D minor lute. Enjoy it. It's fabulous. These are incredible questions. Thank you, Elaine. And I have an expert here who is just giving, knocking them out of the park. So, <laughs> uh, and just um, I have Shannon, Shannon Millard at also sending in some good questions. So um, okay. he's using your Baroque lute method. And he wants to ask you, have you used the Baroque lute often as a continual instrument as opposed to the more common arch lute or thurbo in Renaissance tuning? I've used it to a certain extent, but primarily in duos. So uh, I, if I accompany a flute player playing Telemann or Handel or something, I will use it for that. I don't have a theorbo in D minor tuning. I just have Baroque lutes. Um, and I think Yes, so I do that. I try. It's difficult. It makes my life more difficult because of the mm. different tunings. But I'll try to play uh, Caccini, uh, a company. I'll try to accompany a Caccini on an arch lute. Caccini on an arch lute. I'll try to accompany Marin Marais on a Theorbo. I'll try to accompany Telemann on the D minor tuning. But it, it makes my life a bit more difficult because of the different tunings. And I'm not a great sight reader. Uh, if I played Basso Continuo on one tuning, I would be a much better sight reader because I have to sort of, my brain has to adapt to what tuning I'm playing. So life is more difficult playing the different tunings, but the result is more beautiful because the instruments are more appropriate and the tunings are more appropriate for the music. Mm, great. Um, and he has two more questions. So the, uh, would a lute player of the caliber of Weiss, did I say that right? Leopold Weiss? Uh, Weiss, yes. Would he have been fluent in staff notation in addition to French lute tablature? And if this is the case, why are all of our sources for this music in tablature? Well, again, that's a great question. He certainly was fluent in playing basso continuo. We know that uh, Weiss played basso continuo, um, so he would have been fluent in playing from a notated bass line. Whether he also would have played from a normal score, I, he was a great musician, so he certainly could read it. I would assume that he could read uh, music, lute music, if it were written in score, but I don't know that for a fact. Mm. Um, so to get to your other question, um, why did they use tablature? I think that they used tablature because it showed people where to put the fingers. <laughs> like today. <laughs> As guitarist was today. And yeah. it was a very, very practical, mm -hmm. starting in the late 15th century, it was a very practical system. Also because there were different tunings. Mm -hmm. And if you're playing different tunings, then it's much harder to read music. 
Um, and if you're playing tablature, then you just put the instrument in the proper tuning and you use the fingerings and, and it works. Um, it was Perrine in the late 17th century who tried to get uh, the lute away from tablature. He did. <laughs> very, very practical um, way of writing the music. If you're playing harpsichord and you see a particular note, like a D here or a D there, you, you just know exactly where it is. Yeah. But on the lute, if you were to write, for example, an F, it could be on the first string open, it wow. could be on the second string third, it That's could be on the first string up higher. So it gave the composers or the players a lot of control and saying, this is exactly where I want the music to be played. Right. That, that's so, the best answer I can give. You know, it's, it's like, I know like the tab today, if you, if you tell like a guitar people, if people said, Oh, I play tab people are like, Oh no. But uh, this is like uh, a real, I, I didn't like for people who don't know, tablature is very old. I mean, it's, it's goes right back into the Renaissance. And so, What's the is is tablature okay then? I guess in early music and it's totally legitimate. I have no idea, so you can you can tell me. Tablature is not only legitimate, but tablature was used starting in the 15th century for lutes, for harps, for organs, for harpsichords. So tablature was was just as common as as musical notation for instruments. Wow. Again, with the big advantage that it tells people exactly where to play on, the, on yeah. the instrument. The main disadvantage of tablature is that it only tells you the rhythmic length of the fastest moving note. Mm. So the slower moving notes, you have to understand music. But if you understand the counterpoint of the music, it's not difficult to figure out. Mm. So I think tablature is, is a fantastic uh, tool, particularly if one plays multiple instruments. And it was right. very, very well received in the Renaissance and, and Baroque periods. That's very interesting. And the last question, uh, great question, Shannon. I mean, the, the early music community is very intelligent. <laughs> they come up with the best questions. Okay, so number three is, any thoughts on the type of music education? And I think you alluded to this earlier, a Baroque lutenist might have received, again, thinking of Vice, his agile use of sequences, bass motions, and modulations, as well as his reputation as an improviser. Do they, does that speak to some sort of transplanted partimento type training? Is there any evidence of this? Is that your question, Nick? No, no, no. It's, it's, it's Shannon's question. Yeah. So, and, and, yeah, yeah because everyone's interested in partimento now. And so they're following the Naples conservatories. They use, they're thinking of that as an example. Is that similar or, or is it different for Baroque lutenists? Well, there's no, I, I haven't seen any Baroque lute source that uses the term fundamental, uh, that uses the term partimento. But um, we have various examples of, of realizations for Baroque lute that for me are exactly the same as Partimento. There's a, um, a book, uh, let me just see, I'll give you the exact title. I have it written down. Um, for, 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 uh, I will find it. <laughs> Sorry. Fundamenta, I didn't want to give a wrong title. There's a, a manuscript called Fundamenta, Der lauten Musik und zugleich der Komposition, which is a phenomenal book. It's from the early 18th century. And basically, it's a series of, of figured bass lines with realizations for the Baroque lute in the D minor tuning. No, no uh, melodic lines. So this is, for me, actually a partimento book for the Baroque lute, even though the word partimento isn't used. And what's right. fascinating is in the title, the fundaments of music of lute music simultaneously of composition. So this goes back to a point I made earlier. They were learning through partimento how to improvise and how to compose. And if you get this book uh, that I'm referring to, it was published by the German Lute Society, then you see a fantastic series of realizations of bass lines for the Baroque lute, which I would call partimento, even though it's not mm. entitled such. And then you have by uh, Bichteler, Matthias Bichteler, in a, another manuscript, a whole bunch of pages of, of figured bass with realizations, but not connected to melodies. So mm -hmm. I think that's also the same idea of, of showing people how to improvise or compose over a bass line on the lute. Well, I mean, truly a tremendous guest, the great Professor Peter Croton. I mean, 
Peter, uh, do you want to plug uh, anything? Uh, you obviously have written some phenomenal books uh, that I think people should check out. A Method for the Baroque Lute, A Method for the Renaissance Lute, uh, Performing Baroque Music on the Lute and the Thurbo, Performing Baroque Music on the Classical Guitar. And I'll have all the links in the description. Of course, the famous figured bass on the classical guitar. Um, what would you like to mention, Peter? Any anything uh, that you're working on, or have upcoming, or stuff that we haven't mentioned yet? Um, I think if people go on my website, they can see the books I've written. I have a YouTube channel if you want to see me playing. Um, I guess that that sort of covers it. Maybe just to say that. Um, it's been a huge pleasure to make music since I was five years old. I'm now almost 66, and I still have just as much pleasure in making music as I did when I was five years old. And I think part of it has to do with my feeling that, that music is communication, that we can spontaneously create music to communicate with people. And, um, even though I also search for a high level of technical perfection, let's say, mm -hmm. and I want to make a lot of mistakes. I think if we, the more we connect instrumental playing to language, to expressive language, the more it stays fresh and spontaneous and can last a lifetime. Can I uh, just end off with one final question, which is how have you seen pedagogy change in your lifetime um, from when you were younger, the early music, and as well as the classical mainstream. Have you seen changes? I know uh, the Scola Contorum is a very unique place, but in general, have you noticed people reaching out to you and saying, I'm very interested in this, I'm very interested in what you're, you're doing, and have you seen an uptick of that in recent years? Yeah. Well, I'm living a little bit in a bubble in Basel, because the Scola is just always on the cutting edge of pedagogy. Mm. So I agree some point they introduced a master of improvisation. Um, they're now integrating theater and things like that. Um, so I see the Scola as really changing and adapting to the needs of the time. Um, I don't know so much other, other curriculum or curricula, but in terms of the classical guitar world, there are many classical guitarists who reach out to me that say they would like to play Baroque music or Renaissance music in a more stylistically expressive manner. And I see more and more of that also in the work that I do in Basel. I work with the students of Pablo Marquez, who's a fantastic classical guitarist, but is very interested in historical performance practice. So my feeling is that classical musicians are getting more interested in stylistic performance, expression, rhetoric and improvisation, but this, there's a long way to go. Yeah, that's Pablo. Uh, <laughs> but I still, when I work with, with modern musicians on improvisation, which I do in Bern and in Basel, most of the time when I say, let's work on improvisation, the student will say, I can't improvise. Mm. That's still the case. And my response is, of course you can improvise. We all improvise. I'm improvising right now. You're improvising. I think human beings improvise, children improvise, and it's just a question of recognizing what that means on your instrument. So I would say this has all been developing in the direction that, 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 uh, that we just spoke about. Um, but my hope for the future is that more classically trained musicians would recognize the value of improvisation and composition because that enriches them. I would say a, a musician who doesn't improvise has part of them that's repressed because we're all improvisers. And if you allow that part of you to express itself, then you'll become a fuller, richer musician. I mean, you do you interpret music completely differently because, I mean, you can't go back in time, but do, do you know now with you've gained so much knowledge with the way you play repertoire, has it, vastly changed because of this, all this new knowledge that you've acquired over the years? Yes. Yes, it has. Because when I started playing lute in the late seventies and early eighties, there was still a very strong trend to play the music sort of placidly. Like if you play the right notes and you play them in the right time, that it's fine. And so when I think back of myself on myself in the late seventies, early eighties, 
I hadn't had a sense of what it means to play the music rhetorically. So the more I've studied that, the more I've had um, contact with great musicians, particularly singers who sang in a rhetorical way, my playing has changed and it feels much better than it did before. So yeah, so the, the knowledge has fed in to the feelings. And that, that's basically, because when we play, we have to forget what we know. We can't be thinking about what we're doing when we're playing, but it's like feeding. So the knowledge feeds the intuition, it feeds the feelings. And then when I play, I feel like a very different player than, than 40 years ago, for example. Yes, those are some recordings. <laughs> Well, the great Professor Peter Croton, thank you so much, sir. And I really hope we, you said on a later conversation, I'll hold you to that. I hope we can do that again. Um, it'll, it's, it'll be a real treat. Uh, thank you again for your time. And I hope to speak with you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. It's been a pleasure talking to you.